scream for daddy. Sloppy noise. Can't understand the words. I want to say Paul McCartney called us shit not. I don't know, because I don't really fucking care. Oh, fuck. Non-technical, garbage, shit, stinks, horrible. I like to know exactly what shit sounds like. If this is the future of rock and roll music, then I don't want to be a part of it anymore. The drums are totally lacking. Dude, there's a whole Facebook page. It's Christians Against Slipknot. I think it's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my crap life, man. You read a better record and then go do it and then talk to me. You know, have fun at work on Monday. We grew up in a real religious family, and um, but then I think I saw Paranoid on MTV, and then got intrigued by the dark side. I don't know, I guess I started listening to Maiden probably around 11 or so, but... I mean, I grew up with Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan and all that kind of shit. My father had a huge collection of vinyl, and, uh, you know, they were kind of like ex-hippie, kind of pothead sort of vibe around my house, so there was always a party going on, and there was always music playing. Everything from Black Sabbath, Master of Reality, to Bob Seger, to Pink Floyd, to the Rolling Stones, to the Who. Metal was uh, just an evolution of some of the, the crazy guitar, like Johnny Winter. You know, stuff like this was just really on fire. And that's what drew me to metal music was, you know, the technicalities of guitar. And I don't like, you know, being genre, obviously, you know, we're a metal band. There's no denying that. But I don't even, I don't even really necessarily listen to metal. I find myself listening to the Beatles and Led Zeppelin a lot still. When Slipknot was first put together, I can remember going, this is fantastic. It was a collage, it was a combo, it was an amalgam of all of these different styles. Slipknot basically just kind of took everything and shredded it up and made it what they wanted. And I loved the freedom of that. And I was at their very first live show as Slipknot and I was front row and uh, it was so insane that I remembered saying to myself, and I'd never done this before, I was like, I'm going to sing for this band someday. That's what the first album is all about, is realizing it's time, it's on, it's yours, it's what you've needed, it's what you've wanted, and now it's time. You've had your whole life to be what you finally have dreamt of. I wanted to go heavier. I wanted to embrace something heavier because that was a lot like the music that I listened to. You know, everything from Metallica to Slayer to Ministry, like the hardcore Ministry sound. You know, like I loved that stuff, and I wanted to do. I wanted to do more of that, and also be able to incorporate some of the melody that it felt like Slipknot was missing at the time. Ross Robinson got a tape of um, the band, and as soon as he heard it, he was like, I want to work with these guys. So he, he was going to front his own money to do this band. You know, that's how much he believed in it and how much he saw the potential. Ross was a great producer to have for a band that never worked with a producer before, because he is very involved with what you do. We didn't know what the hell we're doing. You know, we didn't know music business. Yeah, most of us never left the state before, so. So working with him was great, though, because he was uh, nuts, crazy, fun, and, uh, you know, always made you feel good to be there. And I remember Ross just had his headphones on, and he was rocking out to a song, and I had this new Jackson guitar that they just made for me with this custom inlay and fucking, you know, quilt maple top and all this, you know, badass new three thousand dollar guitar or whatever and he just drop kicked the guitar right out of my hands and that's sort of his mentality i mean it's not about anything material or anything physical it's about the energy that you create ross's greatest asset was understanding how this band needed to be and how intense it was and how how many moving parts there were inside the band ross loved working with analog and i don't know i'm glad we did it like, it's a whole different kind of mindset when you're in a studio. You could play your amp in this room and it sounds like whatever, but then try to translate that through a microphone onto the tape. Like it, there's so much to that aspect of it, which I, it's challenging and it's fun. We were all 
in my old apartment on uh, 28th Street in Des Moines when we first got the the rough mixes, basically. And I can remember we were we were just blown away. <laughs> We did manage to get a, I don't know, a more raw sound, and it doesn't sound flat. Some of that uh, juicy, honest kind of sounds you get from analog. There was such a frenetic energy there that it was, it was almost like an unleashing. He was able to keep that intensity during the recording of each person, and just kept that angst, you know, that, you know, pretty much sent us off, you know, on the road. Um, just ready to kill. Ready to take over the world. And the one thing that I love about what we do in these fucking masks, when these masks come off, you know you went for it. They're not nice. They're not made to be air conditioned. Well, I ended up wearing a bondage hood that was a size too small for my head. So my sweat was just filling up <laughs> inside of this thing and my ears were literally under water, under sweat. And it was, you know, I couldn't move and it was pushing my jaw back and it was just extremely uncomfortable. And the outside explains the inside. Mask one, barely see the eyes, barely hear me. Creepy ass fucking clown. That clown will kill you. That clown doesn't think. The clown doesn't care. There's just something not right about it, and I think that's a little bit of the mentality of the band. It's just, it's just really not something right about it, you know what I mean? I mean, none of us knew that would, it would ever have any sort of significance. You know, just kind of rolling the dice and wondering, is this going to work? Is this going to be a year? Is this going to be one album? Or are we going to be able to make a career out of it? We just expected a certain level, and it just turned out that everybody liked it a lot. We were convinced that there were you know, there were 10 other new bands that were going to be bigger than we were. And then, God, were we wrong. <laughs> and it, it got so crazy after the Cold Chamber tour, which was our tour after uh, OzFest, that nobody wanted to take us out on the road with them. Nobody wanted, to, wanted us to open for them because we would play and then half the audience would leave. From day one, we were setting the tone for everything that was going to come after that. However we burn ourselves out really, really hardcore. By the time we went into Iowa, we had the mindset of, oh God, I just need five seconds to, to breathe. It's not so easy to, to throw a bunch of people into a room after you had, say, five years to put your first record together and having songs that didn't quite make it because they weren't quite good. And now you're thrown into a room and you go, okay, write lots of songs and make them all be great. I've always complained that it's like, you can't tell a fucking artist, now walk into a room, there's some paints and shit, now paint me a picture. I mean, like, who says I want to? Literally like a day or two after we got off the road from the first album cycle, you know, Paul was calling me up saying, hey Jim, you know, it's time for us to start writing the next record. We're gonna go for it. And I was like, wow, really that quick? Everyone is in a different place. We've been around the world and back. Never thought we were getting off the road, and boom, got to write a second record. We were going to take a little more time. We talked about taking a little more time, but I don't know, pressure being what it is, we uh, decided we didn't want to be away too long. And, and I think it's important to not forget where you came from as a band, you know, but not to put out the same record over and over again. We didn't want to do the typical follow-up where everything's watered down, everything's very commercial. A lot of record label people wanted a lot, you know, more radio-friendly stuff, so that's when we decided to make the Iowa record and go absolutely the opposite way of what everybody was expecting from us. We were like, screw all that. We're gonna do what we want to do, which is to take everything that we had done on the first album and turn it up to a thousand as far as the darkness goes, the heaviness goes, the, the sonics and the, the visceral, just disgusting feeling that we touched on on the first album, but we really embraced it 
on Iowa. To this day, it's still one of the heaviest records, you know. Left Behind was made of uh, an older song. I, I can remember I'd, when I when I first did it, it was much more melodic than it became. And uh, Ross was like, uh-uh, no, 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 you're trying too hard. Let's get a little more guttural and put a lot more emphasis on it and just make it a, a smack in the mouth. <laughs> The VF4 was kind of cool, so there were goats. And rain and shit. Yeah, rain and goats. And like hail, even. Like, what the fuck do you want? That's what Ross does. He finds the scary moments, the dangerous moments, and he, he amplifies those, and he pushes you to amplify it. I can remember as I was recording uh, this, the title track, Iowa. And he was like, I want you to go somewhere that you wouldn't necessarily have gone before. I want you to take yourself to a place that you're scared to go to, that you've never allowed yourself to go to. So I stripped naked and walked out to the middle of the, of the, of the, the big room at Sound City. And I did that song in two takes. And that was it. It was probably one of the craziest experiences I've ever had. I cut myself up. I threw up all over myself. It was, uh, and you could feel that on the album. Like it's such a disturbing moment. Second clown, don't talk to me. Not available. Not welcome. Get the fuck out of here. Look at my face. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you around. I have nothing to say. This is how the world feels. I'm part of the world. Deal with it. Not a good clown, for sure. That clown was asked to never come back, actually, by certain people. Volume three, Subliminal Verses, Houdini Mansion, Rick Rubin. That's a lot right there. Gosh, that one was a blur, dude. That one was a blur. <laughs> Volume three is actually, it's really hard for me to talk about um, because that was, that was the album I got sober on. And one day I kind of woke up and I was just like, man, I'm, this, this isn't good. I, I need to figure it out or I'm gonna die. So I quit cold turkey in the middle of it and basically kind of had to start from scratch as far as like what I was doing vocally and what I was trying to say lyrically. And I was starting to get a little more esoteric with my lyrics, you know, looking forward instead of backward. Probably one of my most favorite times in my career achieving this PhD known as rock and roll. Third clown, repairing. Repair from those two previous things. Those are animals. Third guy, coming back to life, few more ideas, some different shit, some healing, few more dances, few more colors, a lot more saturation, chill a little bit, but still that guy. Those kinds of things all went into the process of making the record. In between Iowa and Volume 3, I'd gone out and I'd done a, a Stone Sour album and Tour Cycle, you know, kind of brought it back together because I felt like there was something I wasn't getting to do with, with Slipknot, which was a little more melodic stuff. Corey was out doing his thing. Joey was on and off doing whatever thing he was doing. There was a lot of tension in the band. There was a lot of push and pull, and uh, it was a hard album to make. You know, people need to work different shit out of their systems, so it's like, if you need to go out and play with some other band and do something different than this, cool. Then come back and you're reset and refreshed and, you know, we keep going. Well, Slipknot's therapy for most of us, so when you don't get to go to your therapist for years at a time, uh, things can build up. Once we get back together and start doing this, I can feel it coming, I can feel the whirlwind coming, and, and it feels good, it's a, it's a safe place. To me, it's the, the metal version of the Avengers, to be, able, to be honest. You know, we all come together when, it, when, when, when everyone needs us. No matter what the problems are that we have, no matter 
what issues or tensions or anything, we always get back to a point where the music brings us right back. Volume 3 was actually pretty cool because we'd been away for so long. Like there was a lot of unknown. You know, like we were between management. There was different problems within the band and different things. And it was like we were finally able to come in and, and actually sit down and talk and figure shit out and, and, uh, and all be together again. We all ended up living together in this big mansion. Six and a half months locked in a vacancy. It was the old Houdini mansion up there in Laurel Canyon. And um, yeah, lights would go on and off. It was evil. It was uh, ghostly. When I moved into the Houdini mansion, I had just gotten a mortgage. You know, I had a car payment and I had no money. <laughs> None at all. You know, I, I was living, literally living on per diems and I was almost negative in my bank account. People were still experimenting with uh, mind altering chemicals or whatever it was. You know, I mean, we're, we still didn't know if we had a career at that point or not. We hadn't been together like that in quite a while. So I think it was good to be, be in each other's face, you know, getting into the refrigerator at the same time, you know, living together in this, in this world and, and creating some, some music and opening some doors with some new music. I think it was more healing than anything else really. And we, uh, we got focused and we're fucking better for it and yeah, made a good record. It felt really good. We were able to be really creative and I think that's the first time our music started to, to kind of evolve and we started to show another side of the band. It was a big deal to work with Rick Rubin. He still understands the band beginning to end and he always will. So he brought that same intensity to the band and really wanted to make a, a great heavy record with us and not, you know, basically sell out. Rick Rubin is the only person who's gotten the band to say things. So he would sit us down and we would have conversations for the art and he would get people to say things that they've never even said when we've had band meetings. I, don't know, I guess I never expected we we're gonna win anything, so who gives it down? In some ways, I kind of start to get the feeling that we were like the Leonardo DiCaprio of the Grammys. And I was young and angry too, so I was kind of like, yeah, fuck you, fuck your Grammy, fuck whatever. I think I used it as a doorstop for a while, and then I had it on the back of my toilet. Fourth clown, debauchery. I invent the evilest thing I possibly can put on my face. Constructed of leather, cop shades, a chrome Ming the Merciless hat, put it all together, can't see shit, can't breathe, can't, can't feel, can't do anything. Very painful. That was a personal pain. I lost my dad the album before and my mom the album before. And that's how I felt. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to do interviews. I just want to be in my own world and be reminded. All Hope Is Gone was a, that was different. That was very different. That was probably the most disconnected and separated I've felt doing a record. That's the only record, the only album done in Iowa, and it's my least favorite. No tension, no pain, just efficiency. Able to go home, able to sleep. That's not good. It's not good for what we do. This album was just very separated. I was just kind of worried if we were kind of like saving too much money by trying to stay home and maybe should have just gone out somewhere else like we had you know, on previous albums. I don't even remember if we necessarily like jammed as a band before we recorded that record. It seemed a little more, almost a little more like DIY wasn't like working with Ross. Our producer at the time just could not seem to get all nine of us in a room to actually play as a band. Joe recorded that album without anybody playing with him, drum-wise. And then we all had to go in and layer over what he had done. It's the least amount of time we spent on pre-production. Not one of my favorite records. I just find it ironic that it was so hard to make and left such a bad taste in my mind, mouth. And it became number one on Billboard. It was just such an evil joke that something you barely could give anything of yourself to becomes number one.
you have a negative bent, you're going to use that as an excuse to do terrible things. If you're fucked in the head, you're fucked in the head, and you're going to take it from wherever you take it from. But I listen to the most extreme gore, horror stuff, and I've never for a split second thought of actually doing any of that. Metal music has helped me so much not do things that, that are bad or, you know, things that, you know, a, a teenage kid with angst or, you know, even in my 20s, you know, it's, uh, it was a great outlet for me to let some aggression go, relax, you know, get that out of my system and go to bed. So, you know, I owe a lot to music and especially to metal music. If you have a positive bent, you're going to use it to try and change the world. I can lose myself in a guitar and some recording equipment. And to me, that's a, a better way to lose myself than sort of, I guess, drinking my troubles away and forgetting about it for a night. Because, you know, it's still going to be there. At least, uh, at least if my problems are still there after putting an arrangement together of music, at least I have something to show for it other than a hangover and bad breath, I guess. I don't know. I help kids let go of some of the pain that they're holding on to. And if I get one kid to do something great with their life, then so be it. As we started doing photos, I took my photos in this abandoned school. Just outside the hallway, there's a sign that said, all hope is gone. Members of the band, you know, mainly Corey, I remember, saying that would be a great song title and probably even better album title. I hated it. I'm as slipknot as you can be, and we're pretty known for being against, but I'll tell you, even though I hate, even though life is hard, and I use pain as a paintbrush, there's always hope. I was confused with that until Paul died. Then it made sense. That's painful shit to have a foreshadowing like that. After that lesson, when I get vibes like that for things, all it does is remind me it could be a foreshadowing, and that's fucking scary. The fifth record, most beautiful epiphany. You have your whole life to make your first record. What I learned on our fifth was you have the rest of your life to do it again. Each album is based off a temperature, a circumstance. This circumstance for this album, unfortunately, was death. Paul was a great songwriter. He was the type of guy that, he wouldn't just write an arrangement and, and stick with it the way he first put it down. And I found when I was writing music in my garage by myself, I was exploring every part of the fretboard, different positions, you know, how does it sound if I bar it? How does it sound if I move it up higher on the, you know, on the fretboard, lower on the strings, things like that. And I realized that's how Paul used to write. And I would lose patience, but Paul would just be in it, working through it, working through it, working through it. And I'm not a very spiritual person, and I always kind of scoff at people when they, you know, they, oh, they're just telling you that your loved one's with you to make you feel better and, you know, all that stuff. But I... I it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I kind of really felt like he was there helping me through the process. And, you know, that may sound however it sounds. But, uh, you know, he's still teaching me stuff even though he's not with us anymore. You know, the great thing about this album is it really is the story of the last four years. There's a lot of, a lot of pain, a lot of guilt, a lot of uh, reflection, a lot of uh, memory, a lot of remembrance. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff on this. There's a lot of accusatory anger, um, whether it's pointed outward or pointed inward. One of the things that we had to try to learn to do as a band was first we had to see if we could play as a band without Paul. And we proved to ourselves that we could do that and we could feel good about it. And at the end of it, I feel good. I feel good for him. I feel good for me. I feel good for the lost ones. I feel good for the other brothers. This is a special fucking record. And I tell people every day, if this was the last one that I get to do for whatever reason, because life is unpredictable, I'd be just fine. I'd be out of here. 
This is a great, great place to be in life. We're at an age right now where we've inspired a whole generation of, of heavy metal hard rock bands. You know, they grew up listening to us and that makes me feel wonderful because they're passing on what we passed on to them. And I think it's more back to the sort of the roots of what we started out at as, as a band, yet we were able to challenge ourselves a little bit musically and experimentally. And some of the other guys in the band that never really had much of a voice were able to sort of get a little bit more of their ideas and things in there, you know? I do know that I'm probably the best guitar sound I've ever got committed to tape, so. I'm stoked on this record. I, I think the sounds are great. I think it's very organic. We are just Slipknot. There's really no one word that sums up this band except that one word, Slipknot. And if you don't like that,